Hello and welcome to USC. My name is Robin Lewis and I am an Immigration Advisor at the Office of International Services here at U the University of Southern California. I want to give you a big welcome from myself along with my colleagues at OIS. Today I'm here to talk to you a little bit about your immigration status as a new international student. First of all, congratulations for being admitted to the USC. We're excited to have you be part of this big Trojan family. So now what? You have obtained your visa from the U.S. Embassy in your home country. You've entered the United States. You've successfully come into the United States through the port of entry. You've gotten your stamp. You've enrolled in your classes after attending passport verification. You've got your you know, your phone, you have your living area, you know exactly what you're doing and you're ready to start classes. So congratulations on that. Now what? Now what is different about you than your domestic counterparts? What is it that you have to be concerned about that they don't? Most of you are here on an F1 or J1 visa. And in order to keep that, to, to keep that immigration status, there's certain guidelines you need to follow. I'm going to give you a handful of guidelines. Uh, we're just going to touch briefly upon them. Our website, which I'll give you at the end of the presentation, is, has a plethora of information for you. So if you have any questions, you can refer to our website or call our office. And again, I'll give all that information at the end of the presentation. So please keep these main points in in mind as you start your studies and embark on this journey at USC. So how do you maintain your status? Well, for F1 students, you need to enroll in courses full-time every semester. What does enroll full-time mean? Well, for master's students, you need to enroll in at least eight units per semester. For doctoral, at least six units every semester. And if you are a research assistant or a teaching assistant, at least six units per semester. This is only for the fall and the spring semesters. If you want to enroll in any summer courses, you are able to, but it is not required. So when I'm speaking about enrolling full-time, it is just for the fall and the spring. What happens though if you can't enroll in all the, the eight units? If you're a master's student and you just can't enroll in those eight units, what happens? If you're a doctoral student and you're like, I can't enroll in eight, six units this semester, something's happened. There's a reason why the U.S. government allows for that flexibility. It is called a reduced course load, meaning you're reducing the course load for that semester. At OIS, we re require you to submit paperwork one week prior to the add drop deadline every semester if you are going to be under enrolled. The add drop deadline is usually within the first three weeks of each semester. Now, can you just be on a reduced course load for any reason that you want? Unfortunately, no. There are th only three reasons why you can be under enrolled. And those reasons are academic difficulty. If you're having trouble with some of the language or some of the material and you really can only, as a master's student, you're, you feel that you can only enroll in six units, then that is okay. But you can only do that one time in your academic career. Let's say you have some medical issues going on and something's happened and you really need to take a semester where you're not enrolled full-time, you can. You actually can do that for two semesters. So whereas academic difficulty you can only use once, for medical reasons, you can be under-enrolled for two semesters. And finally, during your final semester, you might have completed all the degree requirements besides two units. For most master students in Viterbi, you have to have 27 units that you have to complete. And you've completed 25 and your last semester you only have two left, then that is okay. You just have to submit paperwork to our office at least one week prior to the add drop deadline. We have to let the U.S. government know that it's your final semester. And obviously you can only do that in your final semester, so that's only granted one time. 
So how else do you maintain your immigration status while you're here? That is very important. I'd say this is the most important way to maintain your status. But how else do you maintain your status? Another very, very important way to maintain your status is making sure that your I-20 is valid. Your I-20 or your DS-2019 if you're on a J-1 visa. And by doing that, you look at the end date on your I-20. If that date has expired or it's coming to expire and you have not completed your academic requirements, then you need to request what's called a program extension. I want you right now to look at the expiration date on your DS 2019 or I-20. Usually for master's degrees, the I-20 is given for about a two-year completion, PhD five-year. If you're unable to meet the academic program requirements by that date, you need to file a program extension form and it must be submitted to OIS before that date has passed. The whole reason that these dates are so important is because it ties back, that date ties back to the date that was pretty much stamped on, in your passport when you entered the United States. So you're asking me, what does that mean, Robin? I don't understand. So when you entered the United States, you showed the Port of Entry Officer your F-1 visa and your I-20 your J-1 visa, and your DS-2019. And in their, your passport, they gave you a stamp that said what status you were on, either an F-1 or J-1. And then at, underneath that, you see, what's, you see the letter D slash S, which means duration of stay. That duration of stay ties to the end date of your I-20 because students on F-1 visas or J-1 visas, your end date is so flexible because if you're a PhD program, you're here for five years. If you're in a master's program, you're probably here for two years. So the U.S. government doesn't give an exact end date that your status ends. Instead, they rely on our office, the academic units, and you to keep an, an eye on the date when your status technically ends in the United States. If that date has passed and you haven't finished your program, then technically, you are out of status and you need to reinstate your status which costs money and it's a huge headache so just be very very careful of that end date on your I-20. So how else do you maintain your status? By giving our office address updates. USCIS which is the United States Citizen Immigration Service requires students to, to submit address updates to OIS within 10 days of moving. You can update your address in OASIS every time you move. Even if it's for a month, you need to update the address. It's very, very important. It's very easy to find on our website. There's a link right when you go to it. So anytime you move, make sure you update on our website or you update in, and you update in OASIS both places keep that in mind so what else what else is so important that you need to either do or not do while you're here in the United States one of them is being aware of what you can and cannot do pertaining to work authorization now luckily you are able to work on campus right when you get here if you get a, a position or a job you can work 20 hours per week and you can start pretty much right away and that can be on campus job for anything from working at the Starbucks or working with a professor for RAs and TAs you're already working right you already are granted work here on campus when you are admitted so here is really it's really flexible as long as you're here on campus and you're being paid by USC so you can start that right away now, what gets tricky sometimes is when you decide to work off campus. And if you want to work off campus, it's very particular. You have to be, you're here on an F1 and J1 student visa. So in order for you to work, it must be tied to your studies. It must be an internship. It must be something that will help you gain experience here as a professional. So, you do have the option which, call, which is called Curricular Practical Training, or CPT. It is 20 hours per week in the fall and the spring, 
40 hours per week in the summer is allowed with, by regulations. However, it's very, very strict when we're saying that it needs to be related to your field of study. So if you're studying electrical engineering and you get a great internship in computer science, unfortunately, that's not something you can do. It needs to be related to your field of study. So not only does it need to be related to your field of study, but you must be enrolled in an internship course. That way, it's tied to your academic program. So you do have the option to do that. However, it is up to your academic unit to the GAP, the Graduate and Professional Programs Office, to approve whether or not you're eligible for this internship. And immigration requirements only allow you to be eligible for this internship after you've completed one year of academic study here in the United States on your F1 visa. And I will note that CPT is only for F1 students. So if you come here in the fall, and that's your first semester, you have to be enrolled in classes for the fall and the spring in order to be eligible for CPT internship in the summer. If you come in the spring, you have to be enrolled in spring and in the fall in order to be eligible for the next spring or summer. So keep that in mind, there are a lot of details that go, in, uh, that go on with CPT. So be very, very, read up very, very diligently when you decide that this is something that you might want to do. If you are working off campus and a company has not been approved for CPT, then that, can, that is not maintaining your status. You are technically violating your immigration status. CPT, thankfully, is not like what OPT, which is what I'm going to explain next, it is approved by your academic department and our office. So it, the U.S. government allows us as an international office and your academic unit to decide whether or not it can be granted. So like I just mentioned, the next work authorization is called optional practical training. So what is optional practical training, or also known as OPT? Once you've completed your full course of study, so master's students, you've graduated after two years, PhD, maybe five or six years, you are eligible for what is called OPT. The only way you're eligible for this, though, is if you have not violated your status prior to the completion of your study. So you are enrolling full-time every semester unless you were on a reduced course load. You didn't work off campus unauthorized. You've updated your address. You've complied with everything the U.S. government has asked you to co comply with. If that is the case, then you are eligible for OPT. It is an extension of your stay here in the United States by one year, so you can have one year of work authorization. Required, so unlike CPT, where you can only do 20 hours in the fall and the spring, and you can do 40 hours in the summer, your the way that you maintain your status is by working at least 20 hours per week in your field of study. So again, it has to be something that you are studied, studying. You have to be doing a job related to that. Optional practical training is tied to your major and what it is you studied here. OPT allows you to grow and learn and understand the field that you just studied. So it is, again, it's very educational in a sense and tied to your F1 visa. So unlike CPT, you do need approval with the U.S. government, and that can take up to three months to get approval. That is why we encourage students to apply three months prior to graduation. That way you are approved and ready to go when you graduate, and you can begin working right away. We do have an online OPT workshop on our website. It's right, you can find it right when you get, come to our front page. It is required for you to do the OPT online workshop in order to apply for OPT. It's a workshop that you do on your own uh, and you complete at your own pace, but it needs to be done in order to apply. There's two parts to the application. One is with our office and the other is with the U.S. government and that is all explained there. I know you've just arrived, but this is something that you want to think about. This is something that's a great opportunity and you don't want to miss out on it by because you didn't maintain your immigration status in the prior semesters. So what else? What are other important things that you need to know as an F1 or J1 student? 
Well, I know you just all got here, but you do need to know that when you travel, you do need the following, a valid passport, a valid visa, and a valid v DS 2019 or I-20 signed within one year. What, what, does that, what does that mean? So a valid visa means if you're looking on the F-1 or J-1 visa that you received at the U.S. Embassy, usually you're given that visa for one, two, three, four, five years. It totally depends on what country you are from. Now, in order to enter the country, you need that visa to be valid. If it has expired, you need to do a visa renewal in your home country. It cannot be done within the United States. So it's simply going to the embassy and obtaining a, a new visa stamp so that you can enter the United States. Now, along the same line of thought, though, let's say you decide that you don't want to travel and you only have been granted a one-year visa. If that visa expires while you're here in the United States, that is perfectly okay. What keeps you in valid immigration status is your I-20. If the I-20 or the DS-2019 has not completed, as in the end date has not completed, then you are okay to be here on an expired visa. So keep that in mind uh, as you study and as you begin to travel. And if you do make travel plans, check our website, watch out for our, our emails, and get your I-20 signed if, you, if the third page of your I-20 has not been signed within one year. And for DS-2019, that's your first page. So again, I know you just got here, but keep this in mind. What about, a lot of students ask about their social security number or SSN. SSNs can only be issued for employment purposes. You cannot get an SSN unless you have been given a job here in the United States. So for some, that might mean that you have been given the job right when you get here. You might have been, gotten an on-campus job right your first week being at USC, and that's wonderful. But make sure that you've been here for 10 days before you even apply for a Social Security card. In order to apply for a Social Security card, you need to have a job offer letter and you need a letter from our office. Once you get those two items, then you go to the Social Security office to get your Social Security number. Finally, we at OIS have very strict processing times. We are the highest enrolled international population in the country and we are very happy to have you all here. However, that does mean that things will take a little bit more time than you might expect. For instance, if you want a social security letter, it does take two business days for us to process that. If you want a travel signature, it takes four days for us to process that. If you want a new I-20 because you've lost yours, it takes five business days. If you want to apply for OPT, it takes seven business days for us to process that new I-20. And as I was talking before about the program extension, it takes two weeks for us to process that. So keep these, these dates in mind, and you can find these dates also on our website. Here is our contact information, our phone number, our email, our website, and where we're located. Our website is full of information, anything from working to um, bringing a dependent over the United States because you've gotten married or you have a, a child that you want to bring over, um, anything from programming, different programs that we have in the office. Just please, please, please know that website and go to it whenever you have a question. You will be able to find the answer there. And if you cannot, that's when you can give us a call or you can come in and meet with us. We take all of our appointments by phone, uh, by phone or in person, but you do need to make an appointment to see an immigration or advisor. Appointments are 15 minutes long, uh, but we do encourage you to come in even just, you know, in any events that we're having, we really want to get to know you as a student. So again, thank you for taking the time to listen to me, and I hope that you have a wonderful experience here at USC. We're so happy you're here. We're excited to get to know you, and thank you so much. Fight on.